Currently, we are in the middle of the entry entitled Goy in the Encyclopedia Talmudis. And we've had many classes on it. And that brings us to page Shinhei. That would be 305. And again, it's a Encyclopedia Talmudis, the Talmudical Encyclopedia, um, primarily, which was uh, the main editor, the chief editor, was Rabbi Shloyma Yosef Zevin. And this is volume 5, hey. And Goy, which the, um, began all the way back um, on page... Reish Pei Vav, 286. And um, we're going through the various different things that the Torah says about Goy. And I'm not going to review everything. Um, we're going to continue where we're up to. We're actually in the middle of a subsection, speaking about the sacrifices and the offerings and things like that, that a Goy can or cannot bring in the various different opinions. So we are in the middle of the um, topic regarding karbonis, sacrifices in the times of the temple, <clears throat> whether or not and what and how a guy can bring it. <coughs> All right. So, Shinhei, which would be, as we said, 305. Uh, let's go to the second paragraph. It's just four lines. Karbona sagoi, the offerings, the sacrifices that a goy brings, enam to unim smicha, do not need to have the uh, smicha, which is when the hands of the person offering the sacrifice are placed on the animal prior to it being slaughtered, when the animal is still alive, and you press down with all your might onto the animal, and then afterwards they take it and they slaughter it and they go through the whole process. So if an animal is being brought by a non-Jew, there is no requirement of smicha. Shneemar, for the verse says, Daber o b'nei Yisrael v'goymer v'somach. Speak to the children of Israel, etc. And then he shall place his hands on it. B'nei Yisrael seimchim v'ein ha'goym seimchim. So from the... Um, Wording of the verse, we see clearly that it's only for B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, they have the obligation to do smicha, and the goyim do not. And do not make the mistake and think that, oh, well then a Jew should do the smicha for the sacrifice of the non-Jew. No. If it's an offering being brought by a non-Jew, no one does smicha, not even the Jew, because there's a technicality over here. Smicha has to be done by the owner, the one who's bringing the offering. You can't have someone else do smicha. So since the owner here, in this case, is a non-Jew, there is no option, there is no obligation, there's no requirement, and there is no option. And therefore, there's no smicha. The guy can't do it, as we just said, and he can't have someone else, a Jew, do it for him because that's not the person bringing the offering. All right, and I believe this is where we're up to, this point. Minchas goy. Now you have, amongst the offerings in Leviticus, you have what's called a mincha. That's a flower offering. It's not an animal. It's not a bird or any fowl. It is flower. That is a type of an offering that a person can bring, known as mincha. Not to be confused with the afternoon prayer. For those of you that are familiar with the legal Hebrew term for the daily afternoon prayer, don't get confused this really has nothing to do with that. Minchas goy, a flower offering as a sacrifice by a non-Jew. For those opinions that maintain that we do receive a mincha from a non-Jew, because that itself is disputed. And the more accepted opinion is that a goy cannot bring any mincha. But according to the opinion that a guy can 
bring a mincha. To una, it is required shemen, oil, ulavaina, and frankincense. Vahagasha, and bringing it. Vinik metzes, and it has to be um, scooped out. It's a special type of a scooping that the Koyin, the priest, does, um, primarily using his three fingers, the three middle fingers, and scooping out a certain amount. Vishireha, la Koyinim Kishel Yisrael. And the remainder part, the part which is not burnt on the altar, is eaten by the Koyinim, by the priests, just like the mincha of a Jew. You know, it's everything we just listed is how a Jew would bring his mincha. All of those requirements are if a Jew is bringing a carbon mincha. It needs to have oil, olive oil. If it doesn't have olive oil, the um, mincha offering is invalid. There is um, just like one or two exceptions of the mincha that doesn't have oil. Otherwise, with, except for the, um, the very few exceptions, every mincha has to have mixed oil with it. Same thing with levoina, this type of um, frankincense is what it's called in English. And the bringing of it in a special way, and the kemitza, which he spoke about, all of these things have to be done by a Jew who's bringing his karma. So too, if a non-Jew is bringing a karma mincha, all of this has to be done. Shalomei goyim. Now what about a karban shlomim that a non-Jew is bringing? And again, for those that maintain that we could receive it from him. Because remember, the standard or within the opinions in the Talmud, the mainstream opinion is that we don't accept these types of sacrifices from the non-Jew. Basically, the non-Jew can only bring a carbon oila, a burnt offering. However, there is one opinion that maintains that we could accept a mincha and likewise a shlamim. A shlamim is a peace offering where part of the animal gets burnt onto the altar to, it's brought to God. Part of it is eaten by the koyhanim and part of it is eaten by the individual who's offering the carbon, who's bringing the sacrifice. So, according to the opinion that maintains that we are allowed to accept a shlamim, a burnt offering from the non-Jew, <clears> to <throat> unim tenufa, it is required to have the waving, kishal mi Yisrael, just like a, a peace offering brought by a Jew. Meaning to say that the um, priest takes the animal and he has to take the parched animal and he has to wave it up and down in all four directions. Ella. The only thing is though, Shagoyim atzmam eina menifim. The goyim can't do it. There's no such thing as having the non-Jew. Even though he's bringing the offering, it's his peace offering, he can't be the one to do the waving. And here there's no problem with having someone else do it because it doesn't have to be done by the person offering it. Unlike the, um, the um, smicha that we spoke about before, the putting your hands on top of the head of the animal before it's slaughtered. That has to be done by the owner, and that can't be done by a non-Jew, therefore it's not done. Whereas here, um, the shlumim, the peace offering, the waving is done, and it doesn't have to be done by the owner, and it can't be done by a non-Jew. So it's done by a Jew. Shanamar, how do we know that the Nanju cannot do the Tnufa, the waving? For the verse which speaks about this in Leviticus, chapter 7, verse 29, says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying that if one is going to bring a sacrifice, he, they have to have it waved. Again, it says, B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. B'nai Yisrael menifim goyim menifim. Jews, the children of Israel, they do the waving, non-Jews do not. Ella, the only thing is, the non-Jew can appoint a shliach, uh, a representative, 
to do the tznu for the waving on his behalf. And that's what would be done. So again, this is all only according to the opinion that a non-Jew can offer a peace offering. So according to that opinion, it does have tznufa waving. However, the non-Jew doesn't do it, so a Jew does it on his behalf. The yeish gerasim shein karban goyim tuuna tnufa. And then there is another version that says that the sacrifice brought by a non-Jew does not require any type of waving. So that itself is disputed, whether or not there is the waving done. So one opinion says, no, there is no waving done at all. Not just that the guy doesn't do it, no one does it. And he brings an offering, and there's no waving done. All right, now we're going to give a whole list of things which generally apply when dealing with kachim, with sacred um, items or parts of sacrifices. So generally, when a Jew brings an offering, it's very clear that certain things um, are required. And the question is, well, what about a non-Jew? Nechleku tanoim. There is a dispute amongst the Mishnaic sages, known as the Tanoim. Im the mizbeach shel goyim, whether when dealing with sacrificial things brought about by non-Jews onto the altar, chayovim, whether there still is um, a liability of the following. Mishum, mi'ila. Mi'ila means when one abuses or um, misuses, I should say, anything which belongs to the Holy Temple. A part of an animal, a carbon, which was not supposed to be eaten by a, per, uh, a certain individual. So that person would be um, misusing. So there's a lot of that anything which belongs to the temple can't be misused. So, is there mi'ila? Vituma. And what about impurity? If the piece of meat, which is a sacrifice, became contaminated, became impure. Vinoisar. Noisar means leftover uh, parts of the sacrifice after the prescribed time to eat it. So certain sacrifices have to be eaten that very day and the following night. So by the next morning, it's called noisar. Other sacrifices you have that day, the following night, and the entire next day. Well then, after that day, by nightfall of the second night, then it would become noisar. So there's a prohibition of leaving over any parts of the animal after the time that they can't be eaten. And if it was left over, then it becomes nicer. And then there's a separate prohibition of eating it. And it has to be burnt. Not offered on the altar as a sacrifice, but it's got to be burnt to get rid of it. You can't just throw it out because it's sacred meat. And you can't eat it. So it's special uh, laws applying to that. Ufigul. Now, pigul is a sacrifice that was offered with an inappropriate thought. <clears throat> that while the person offering this animal thought, for example, to eat it outside of the place or time frame when it's supposed to be eaten. So, for example, if this particular sacrifice has to be eaten within an area in the Holy Temple, and the person had in mind, I'm going to eat it at home, three miles away. Thinking that while bringing the offering it makes it invalid. Or if, let's say, the person thought, well, this animal, biblically, this sacrifice, can be eaten all day today and all night to- tonight. I'm going to eat it in four days from now. That thought disqualifies that sacrifice and again makes it pigul. Ushchutechutz. And then you have another thing. Shchutechutz means slaughtering it 
outside of the area where it is permitted to be slaughtered. So some sacrifices have to be slaughtered in a very specific area, or at the very least, they have to be um, slaughtered anywhere in the courtyard called the Azara. So if someone brings a sacrifice, but they actually slaughter the animal outside of, let's say, the Azara of the courtyard, well then again, that disqualifies it as well. Even though it's an animal which was designated as a sacrifice, and it has no blemishes, and after they slaughter it, they do everything properly, they catch the blood, they sprinkle it, and then they skin it, and then they cut it properly, and then they're ready to, everything is ready. Because they slaughtered it outside of the prescribed place, disqualified. The imam is in Timura. And another question. Do the non-Jews, can they make Timura? Timura is another prohibition of an exchange. If there is an animal that has been designated as a certain sacrifice, to then take a different animal, even a better animal, a stronger animal, a nicer animal in all regards, and to say, I'm going to switch. I no longer want that animal A should be brought as that particular sacrifice that I had designated it, but I'd like to take that sanctity and put it onto animal B. And now animal A is free, and it's a regular animal, and animal B now became its substitute. That's forbidden, and it's not allowed. And if one does that, then they're both sanctified. So the question is, all of these things, do they apply by a sacrifice that a non-Jew is offering, as they do apply to uh, sacrifices that a Jew would bring? So again, the list was Mi'ila, Tuma, Noisar, Pigul, Shchutechutz, and Timura. So we said it's a machloikas, it's a dispute between the Talmudic sages of the times of the Mishnah. Rabbi Shimon Oimer, the Tano Rab Shimon says, She'ein chayovim bohem b'chol eile, that the non-Jews are not liable in all of the above. Those only apply to a Jew offering a sacrifice. If a non-Jew did any of the above, no liability, no sin, no harm done. And now we're going to explain each one of them, how he derives biblically that it does not apply to non-Jews. Shekain b'me'ila. The first one was me'ila, was forbidden misuse. L'meidim b'gzeira shava. We learn out in a certain way called a gzeira shava. A gzeira shava is a certain formula of the oral tradition of how we derive certain laws. And it's basically when a word is used in one topic and the same word is used in a different section in the Torah, in the Bible, so we apply what it says explicitly in one place to the other place. And the Gzei Roshava here is chet chet. It uses the word chet, which means sin. It has the same word here and the same word there. Mitruma she'ena begoy. From truma. Truma is a certain type of a donation. It's like tithing. And that does not apply to a non-Jew. And since over there it uses the word chet, and since by me'ila, by the misuse of sanctity, it also uses the word chet, so we, compa- we apply what it says by truma to what it says by me'ila, and thus it doesn't apply to the non-Jew. Oi, or alternatively, another way to exclude the non-Jew from me'ila, from the misuse prohibition. Mishum shenema b'karbono yistabro b'nei Yisrael. Because when it comes to the sacrifices, it says, speak unto the children of Israel. So that excludes the non-Jews from all of these laws. So yes, they may be able to bring a sacrifice, the non-Jews. However, they don't have the liability that the Jew does. The only thing is, according to this opinion, rabbinically, 
you're not allowed to derive pleasure from it. So the rabbis came along and they made a decree and they said that even though biblically it's not mi'ila, it's not forbidden to use, but they said, let's treat it as if it is and therefore it's not allowed. But the rabbis created a... Prohibition. For, for the Gentiles. Yep. No, I'm sorry. For the Jew. In other words, the question is, um, if a Gentile, a non-Jew, brought a sacrifice, does the Jew still have the prohibition of Me'ilah? The non-Jew brought this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a sacrifice. So it has some sanctity to it. So now, if a Jew misuses that, is he moyo? Is he con con committing this sin as would be the case if a Jew had brought that sacrifice? So we're saying, no, there's no me'ila when it comes to a sacrifice of a non-Jew. However, rabbinically, it is still forbidden for any Jew to derive benefit from it, as if it were under the um, prohibition of me'ila. Mm -hmm. Uvetuma namar, and when it comes to making it impure, can normally if you have um, <coughs> meat of a sacrifice, you can't let it become impure. Well, how about if it's meat that a non-Jew, a Gentile, brought as a sacrifice? So there it says, "V'nazur mikatshu b'nei Yisrael." Again, the verse in Leviticus, chapter twenty-two, verse two, it says, "And they shall separate from the holy things of b'nei Yisrael." of the children of Israel, and not from the holy things or the sacrifices, I should say, of the non-Jews. So there again we have that there's no prohibition of make, contaminating it and making it impure. And what about the other two things that we spoke about? The leftover meat of a sacrifice after its time or that which became a disqualified with a wrong thought. Lemedimituma, those we learn out and derive them from tuma, from the impurity. That since it doesn't apply to the impurity, there's no prohibition there. So too, there's no noiser and pigul. Utmura, and then the exchange, which is forbidden, hukshalemaiser behema. That is compared to the tithing of the animals. Every Jew that owns animals, so annually. He needs to give one tenth of those animals as a sacrifice. Shebemaiser behema nemar. When it comes to tithing the animals, the verse states clearly, "Vahayahu usmurasoi," that he and his exchange shall both shall both be holy. So from there we learn out that it doesn't apply. Because Meiser Behema is only for Jews. And since by Meiser Behema it speaks about Tmura, the exchange, so then the exchange never applies to a non Jew. Oi, Lefi, Shebetmura Nemar, or alternatively, because when it comes to Tmura, to this exchange, 
It states, Taber al Yisrael, speak to the Jewish people. So we have a verse that says that. That was all the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. None of the above applies biblically to um, a non-Jew's sacrifice. For Rabbi Yosei, we're on the top of Shin Vav of page 306. And Rabbi Yosei mechayev b'chol eile. Rabbi Yosei, on the other hand, he does obligate and he makes liable for all of the above, k'moi b'kadshe Yisrael just as if it were a sacrifice that was brought by a Jew. All of the things, the list of the six things, he says, do apply to a carbon of a non-Jew. Shenemar b'kadshe goyim, and he says very simply, because when it speaks about the sacrifices of non-Jews, the verse states, La Hashem. Can you pass me a Tanakh or a Chumash? That's right. Thank you. Leviticus. Twenty two verse eighteen. So although it says Daber la Harain Velbanov Velkobne Isro, God says to Moses, Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all of the children of Israel. Vi Omarto Alehem. And you are to say to them, Ish, Ish, any man, Mi Beis Yisrael, from the house of Israel, Umin Hager Bi Yisrael, and from the Ger amongst the Jews or in the Jews, Asher Yakriv Karbanoi, which will offer his sacrifice, the Cholni Dreyhem, for any of their vows, will Cholni Dvaisam, or for any of their donations, Asher Yakrivu La Hashem Loila, that they will bring to Hashem for a burnt offering. Uh, so that, that actually is the is the verse that would be the source that a non Jew can bring um, sacrifices. And since it says Loila, that would be the argument of the mainstream opinion that it could only be an Oila, a burnt offering. But at any rate, it says La Hashem. To Hashem. So based on that word that has to be brought to God, Rabbi Yesi says that therefore all of the prohibitions or liabilities that we've just listed apply to the non-Jews as well. And we conclude the Encyclopedia Talmudis brings down over here the verdict based on what the Rambam, Maimonides, Rules, and that is halacha ki Rabbi Shimon. The halacha is like the first opinion, Rabbi Shimon, who said that none of these apply, milvad yishchut echutz, with one exception. Out of the six things, one of them does apply to non-Jews to their sacrifices, and that is the prohibition against slaughtering it outside of the proper place. that the Rambam, in that one case, rules like Rabbi Yesi. But in all the other ones, the other five cases, he rules like Rabbi Shimon. Now, we have to read on, because, let's not mi- misunderstand it. However, the non-Jews themselves, mutarim, are permitted to offer sacrifices to God in any place. When we're saying that you're not allowed to slaughter it outside of the courtyard of the Holy Temple or outside of the proper designated area, that means that if a Jew is offering it, is, is doing the service for them, then he can't do it. But the non-Jew himself who's offering a sacrifice to God 
He can offer it wherever he wants. He's not restricted to bring it in the Holy Temple. So he can do the slaughtering wherever he wants, and that's fine. Even in the time where the Bamois, which were the personal or the private altars that everybody would make for themselves, even in the time where that was forbidden, because, well, historically speaking, by Jewish law for the Jewish people, <clears throat> there were times where the Bamois were permitted. That although there was a Mishkan, there was a tabernacle, but yet any individual could bring a sacrifice where he wanted. Um, however, once it came to a certain point, it became forbidden from then. Uh, well, actually, it was forbidden temporarily, but then it became permitted, and then again it became forbidden. Now, since, surely, since the uh, building and the dedication of the first temple by King Solomon, from then on, it is surely forbidden for a Jew to bring a sacrifice anywhere outside of the uh, temple. All right? So even in a time where Jews are not permitted to bring a sacrifice anywhere outside of the temple, even then, the non-Jews are permitted to bring it wherever they please. The Eina Muzarim al Shkutechutz, and they're not commanded about Shkutechutz, about the prohibition of slaughtering it or offering it outside. So that's the one case where we follow Rabbi Yosei. Otherwise, we follow Rabbi Shimon, that, that um, they're not uh, liable. So in all of the cases, we follow Reb Shimon that said that they, all of those rules don't apply to non-Jews except for Shechut Echutz. Meaning a Jew is not allowed to partake, to sacrifice or to slaughter um, a sacrifice that a non-Jew is bringing. In other words, practically speaking, um, I'm not saying to go do this yet. No. Let's say someone, nowadays, although um, we're going to have the temple sooner than most anybody can really expect. But until that moment, let's speak for the past 19 plus 1900 years plus, up until this point. If a non-Jew wants to bring a sacrifice, a Jew can teach him what to do, can instruct him, and tell him what to do. But you have to be very careful. A Jew cannot in any way assist him. The Jew can teach him, guide him, tell him, inform him how to do, how to bring the sacrifice, but he can't participate. Why? Because it's outside of the Beis HaMikdash. So that's the one case where we do follow um, Rabbi Yisei. But for the Jew, but for the non-Jew himself, he can bring the carbon whatever he wants. That's not called Shechot Echutz. Bitzmura. Now about the exchange, which we said for a Jew is forbidden to do, there is a dispute between the Rishonim, the um, post-Talmud codifiers, such as the Rambam and his main critic, the Ravid. If, rabbinically speaking, Goy Shehemir Harezoi Tmura Oy enoy oy set mura klau. Biblically speaking, we all agree that we follow Rabbi Shimon. And therefore, there's no such thing as an exchange when the non Jew does that. It doesn't go into effect. But, rabbinically speaking, does it? And does the second animal also receive the sanctity as the first one? Or even rabbinically, doesn't apply. So that is a dispute um, according to the Rambam 
Rabbinically speaking, it does. And according to the Raivid, no such thing that even rabbinically, there's no such thing as exchange as Tmura by the sacrifice of an Anju. Next case. An interesting case. Goy, Shehiktish Behema. An Anju that designated, sanctified an animal to be an offering. She's kapir by Yisrael in order for a Jew to be atoned. Normally, there's a list of certain sins, a long list of sins, that if a Jew commits any of those sins inadvertently, he has to bring a sacrifice called a chatos, a sin offering. And when he repents and he brings that animal, or whatever, depending on what he can afford, when he brings that sacrifice, as a sacrifice to God in the Holy Temple, he is forgiven and atoned for. Well, what about if a non-Jew wants to, so to say, sponsor the carbon, the sacrifice, so that the Jew can be forgiven and atoned for? Hagavar <clears throat> Safik. This is a doubt. Im hoilchim linen tmura achar hamaktish shugoi so in such a case, the question is, when it comes to making an exchange, do we go according to the one who actually sanctified the animal, the real, the one who's offering it, which is actually the non-Jew, and therefore there's no tzmura in that case, the exchange doesn't work, or do you go according to the person who it's brought for? And even though it's being sponsored and brought and paid for by the non-Jew, but since he's bringing it for the Jew, so maybe, according to one mm. opinion, one way to look at it, there there would be tumura. And if someone then takes a, that animal before it's uh, slaughtered and says, I want to exchange it for this animal, maybe then that rule would apply and the second animal would become sanctified because that animal was designated, the first one was designated for the Jew. So that's a doubt. And therefore, what should be the ruling in this case of a doubt is a dispute amongst the codifiers. Yes, I mean, there are those that say, the doubt is if the one who made the exchange is the non-Jew. So in other words, like this. There's a Jew who needs to bring a sacrifice. A non-Jew said, I'm going to bring it for him on his behalf. Now, the non-Jew went ahead and made the exchange of that animal for a different animal. That's, that's where we have a doubt as to whether it works or not. Because normally, uh, the exchange does not work if a non-Jew does it. But here, because the one who is getting atoned is a Jew, maybe it would work. That's one way. The Yeshem, some say, Shehemir Bo Yisrael, no. In that case, where a non-Jew is sponsoring and bringing a sacrifice to atone for a Jew, and if the non-Jew makes this exchange, everyone agrees, according to the second opinion, it still doesn't work because it's a non-Jew. And there is no tzmura, there's no exchange by a sacrifice of a non-Jew. The question is, if a Jew made an exchange, a tzmura, in this case. So again, same case, a Jew owes a sacrifice, he needs an atonement. A non-Jew is sponsoring and offering um, a carbon, a sacrifice, for that Jew. And now, a Jew made an exchange and said, Animal B instead of animal A. That's where we have a doubt. That's the other way to look at it. <clears throat> now, um, there is the special ornament of the high priest called the tzitz. That was a gold plate which was tied around his head. He wore it on his forehead. And it said on it, Kodesh Lahashem. And it was a special 
ornament that the high priest wore. Now, that ornament that he wore served as an atonement for any um, inadvertent tuma, um, any um, impurification or defilement that happened to any of the sacred um, sacrifices. So the tzitz, that gold plate that he wore on his um, forehead, would atone for it. So now, kotche goyim, sacrifices of non-Jews, shenitmu, that became defiled, that became tame, impure. Ein na tzitz meratz aleim, then this tzitz does not uh, atone for that impurity. Whether it became defiled by mistake, whether it was done intentional, whether it was done by accident, or whether it was done willingly, it doesn't matter. Because the verse which states that the tzitz um, will atone for impurities, it says, lahem, that it should be for willing, for Hashem to want for them, for the Jewish people. The loyla goyim and not for the Gentiles. Shagoyim einam b'nei hartsa'al hakadosh baruchu. For the non-Jews are not members, they're not in the category of being accepted as willing for God. She'einam misratze lahem. For he does not um, willingly or accept things like that for them. From that verse we learn out that only if something happens to the sacrifice of a Jew will the tzitz fix it up. Whereas for the non-Jew, no, nope, you want to bring a sacrifice, that's fine. And if it became tame, too bad. That brings us now next to the next subdivision in this topic of Goy. And that is Binidarim Vehekteshois. When it comes to vows and to sanctifying things. <clears throat> See, when it comes to a Jew, it's very clear biblically. A Jew certainly has tremendous oral power, verbal power. When a Jew says something, it can actually make a change in something if he owns it. For example, if a Jew owns property and he decides that he is going to <clears throat> donate that to the, to the temple, as soon as he says that, it becomes property of the temple. Um, he can't donate someone else's. That doesn't work. No. Nope. A Jew can't say, my next-door neighbor's field is to be saying that. It doesn't work. Whether his next-door neighbor is Jew or Gentile, irrelevant. One can only do that through his own things. Or the same thing when it comes to a neder, to a vow. Um, again, it's very clear that a Jew can take upon himself a vow and he can forbid, let's say, certain foods upon himself. He can say, this loaf of bread is forbidden for me to eat. Now, if it's his loaf of bread, he can do that. If it's someone else's loaf of bread, he can do that as well because he's saying forbidden for me to eat. And if it's his loaf of bread, he can say it's forbidden for anyone to eat. He can do that too. Or he can say, my loaf of bread is forbidden for so-and-so to eat. He can do that too. What he can't do is someone else's loaf of bread, the only thing he can do is forbid it for himself. He can't say that loaf of bread is forbidden for that person or for any other person for that matter. That doesn't work. Okay, so are there many, many rules and laws and details when it comes to vows and when it comes to 
sanctifying something, how it's done, and it's very clear, and there's tractates which speak all about it when it comes to the Jew. The question is, what about the Goy, the non-Jew? So, <clears throat> um, we are on Shinvav 306, the bottom paragraph. Hagoyim nisma'atu mitoiras arochin. The non-Jews are excluded from the whole topic of what's called erchin. Erchin is a specific type of a vow. Very, very specific. And it's found in the Torah, in the Chumash. Leviticus chapter 27. It basically works as follows. If a Jew says, the erech, the value of so-and-so is upon me, then there are very specific amounts of money. It's very specific, depends on the person's age. Depends male, female, and the age. He then needs to pay that amount of money to the Beis HaMikdash. He could say, my erech, my value, and then we see, is it male, is it female, how old is he or she? He could say the erech of so-and-so. All right, is so-and-so male, female, how old are they? Very specific. That whole discussion does not apply to Goyim. Shunem of Erchin, because in this section, which speaks about this very specific type of donation, it says there, Daber al-Bnei Yisrael, speak unto the children of Israel, v'loi ha-goyim, to exclude the non-Jews. Ela, however, rather, shenech leku tanoim, there's a dispute amongst the tanoim, the Talmudic sages of the Mishnah time. Mima nisma'atu, what precisely are the goyim excluded from when it comes to erchin? Rabbi Meir, oimer, ein ha ma'arich. Rabbi Meir says, that a non-Jew can't make such a vow. If a non-Jew says, my erech is upon me, he owes nothing to the temple. If a non-Jew says, the erech of so-and-so is upon me, he owes nothing to the temple. That's what it means. They can't make such a vow. You want to donate money? Donate money. But you can't say erech of myself or of so-and-so, and then we don't look into the age. No, that whole thing only applies to Jews. A non-Jew that said, my value is upon me, or the value of so-and-so is upon me, he said nothing. But according to Rabbi Meir, he, that non-Jew, he can be evaluated. Meaning if a Jew says that the erech of so-and-so, and so-and-so is a non-Jew, is upon me, then we do. Is he male? Is she female? How old is he or she? And that's it. And then the Jew owes the money. So when we exclude the non-Jew, we mean from being the donor, from being the speaker, but from being the article, from being that which is ne'erach, that, according to Reb Meir, applies. Shim Oimer Yisrael, that if a Jew says, Erech goy ze olai, that the erech, the value of this goy is upon me, noisen erkoi, he gives his erech, according to the age of the non-Jew, as it is described in the Chumash. Up to age, from age 30 days to age 5, from age 5 to age 20, from age 20 to age 60, and from 60 and above. So the, and then depends male and female. So it's a very clear chart that the Torah tells us. So according to the mayor, a guy falls into that category. He just can't be the one to make that, that declaration. But if a Jew made the declaration and he used that particular non-Jew as his article, then it applies. And the Jew owes that money. Shenemar Boisei Kosov, and Rameir derives this because in the same verse it says, Ish, man. He learns from that word Ish, man, that that's an inclusive. Yes, it says B'nai Yisrael, speak unto the children of Israel, which excludes the Goyim. But it says Ish, which includes the Goyim. So how does he deal with that, Rav Meir? It's very simple. 
The goyim are excluded from being the ones to make the declaration and donation, but they're included to be the article through which the Jew makes the declaration. For Rabbi Yehuda, Imer, and the arguing opinion, Rabbi Yehuda, he says, Ein agoy ne'erach, that the non-Jew cannot be evaluated. And if a Jew says, the value of so-and-so is upon me, if so-and-so is a non-Jew, then the Jew said nothing. Shanismaik mi b'nei Yisrael, because he's excluded, because it says in the verse, speak unto the children of Israel. Avol marich. But Rabbi Yudha says the non-Jew, he could make the declaration. He could make the donation if he uses a Jew as the article. Shenis Rabbi Meish, because of the word Ish. So they basically have two opposite opinions. So they both agree that non-Jews are excluded from Erchim. And they both agree that there's the word Ish which includes him. Question is, which part is he excluded from? Which part is he included? So according to Rabbi Yehuda, the second opinion, if a Jew says, Erech so-and-so is upon me, and so-and-so is a non-Jew, that means nothing and he owes nothing. But if a non-Jew says, my Erech is upon me, it still means nothing. And if a non-Jew says, the Erech of so-and-so, and so-and-so is also a non-Jew, it still means nothing. But if the non-Jew says, Erech so-and-so is upon me, and that so-and-so is a Jew, then we follow the chart, the <coughs> listing in the Torah. Is it male, female, what's the age? And according to that, this non-Jew now owes that money as Erech to the Beis HaMikdash. V'yesh Mefarshim. Now there are those commentaries which interpret it as follows. Shebein le Rabbi Meir, that whether according to Rabbi Meir, shemar b'meish, that he includes from the word ish, shene'erach, that the non-Jew could be the article through which the Jew becomes obligated to pay. Ubein le Rabbi Yehuda, or whether according to Rabbi Yehuda, shemar be, shema'arich, that says the opposite, that he says from the word ish, he says that the non-Jew could be the one to make the declaration and obligate himself. They say they're not talking about the word ish, which is in the portion, the section in the Torah, which speaks about this mitzvah of arachin, of donating according to the person's value. That's not the ish that we're talking about, which we said was in Vayikra, Leviticus, chapter 22, <coughs> verse, sorry, 27 perhaps, verse 2, 27, 2, yeah, that's right. There it says, Daber al Bnei Yisrael, speak unto the children of Israel, excluding the Goyim. Vilmart al and say unto them, Ish, any man, which includes the Goyim. Kiafli neder, if you will articulate a um, vow, Be'erkechon Efoshes Lashem, regarding a valuation of living beings for Hashem. Okay. According to some commentaries, that's not the word ish, that they're each arguing on what is, how it includes the goy. But rather, But rather from the word ish, which is, where, which is mentioned when it comes to either vows or free will uh, donations of sacrifices. To simply teach us that the non-Jews can bring a sacrifice either by way of a vow, a neder, or by way of an adava, which is donating the animal. No, it's, it's really, it's, a neder means that he took it upon himself, that the person is obligating himself to bring an animal. A nedava means he's obligating the animal to be brought by him. So it's, 
it's, it's, there, there are differences, but it's very similar. And that's the word ish that we're including the non-Jews. And therefore we're learning out that non-Jews are included in Erech, one way or the other, either Reb Meir or Reb Yehuda, from comparing it to the Nedarim, the vows of how they bring a carbon. Shene'emar, because it says, by the Erech, ki'afli neder be'erkecha, that if a person will um, articulate by way of a vow, and then it says be'erkecha, of your Value. Hukshu erchin the darim. So that verse is juxtaposing erchin, that type of a donation of money by making this particular type of a vow, to regular vows where a person is bringing an animal or whatever as a as a sacrifice. What does that mean? So now we're going to explain what the dispute is. Rava Omar, Rava, which is a Talmudic sage. <coughs> which is post-Mishnah, Rava said, Shemistaber ki Rabbi Meir, that it makes more sense to follow Rabbi Meir's opinion, who says that the Goy can be the article of the Jew evaluating. Not that the Goy can actually be the one to make the donation by saying Erech of a Jew, but that he could be what the Jew says, the Erech of so-and-so. So if so-and-so is a non-Jew. Lefishanemar, and he says, I'll tell you why, very simply. He says, logically, Rebeir makes more sense because we have a verse, and this verse is found in the book of Ezra, back, going back all the way to Ezra, where we're speaking about the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple, when they came back from the exile. So there, this is a statement made, it is not for you and for us to build a home, an edifice for our God. And that verse that when a person says Erech, the money goes to the upkeep of the temple. And generally speaking, we're not supposed to accept money from non-Jews for the building or the upkeep of the temple. And that's why it makes sense to follow a mayor that how does a non-Jew have a, uh, anything to do with Erech? That if a Jew says that the Erech, the value of so-and-so, who's a non-Jew, is upon me. So now that just tells us how much money the Jew has to pay for the upkeep, or for the maintenance, I should say, of the Beis HaMikdash. But if you're going to go according to Rabbi Yehuda, it comes out that a non-Jew is going to be donating money for the maintenance of the Beis HaMikdash. And according to this verse in Ezra, that's not appropriate. Now, within Rabbi Yehuda himself, remember, Rabbi Yehuda is the one who says that the non-Jew can't be evaluated, but he could be the one to make the evaluation, and therefore he ends up donating the money. Within that opinion, there's a dispute of Amirayim, of Talmudic sages. Avimi Omar, Avimi said, Although, yes, according to Rabbi Yehuda, he can, the non-Jew, can be the one to make the declaration and then to owe the money. We're not going to use his money, though, for the maintenance of the Beis HaMikdash. Because of that verse in Ezra. And it was normally when someone says Erech and therefore has to donate a certain amount of money based on the gender and on the age. That money goes for the maintenance. But this is the non-Jew. The money of the non-Jew is what's given. So then, they're not going to use it for the maintenance. Ella, what do you do? Yiganez. It is to be put away. Just bury it. 
He has to pay the money for the base of Mikdash. But then the treasury of the base of Mikdash has to take that money and just get rid of it. They just have to, you know, bury it. Shasr Bana. And the reason for that is because that money is actually forbidden to derive any benefit from. No one can have any pleasure from it because it became holy money and yet there's nothing you can do with it. Sharehu Hektish. The money became holy. So you can't derive any benefit and because of the verse, you can't use it for the maintenance or the upkeep of the Beis HaMikdash. So there's nothing to do with it. So he has to pay the money, but no one can benefit from it. The Rava Omar, and on the other hand, Rava, he says that according to, within Rabbi Huda's opinion, that the non-Jew does give the money. He says, no, that the Erech, the money that the non-Jew is giving because he said that the value of so-and-so, which was a Jew, is upon me, that money coming from the non-Jew does go for the maintenance of the Beis HaMikdash. He says the verse in Ezra was only speaking about that time period. It's not an eternal law. It's only that at the time of Ezra, when they were building the um, second temple and they needed, they needed to um, raise funds for that, So he said, we're not going to accept any funds from the non-Jews. Why? Because they did not have good intentions, those non-Jews that wanted to donate the money then. They wanted that the Jews then would listen to their advice. Because you know how it is. A person gives money, so all of a sudden... He becomes an opinion. He gave a donation, so now you got to listen to him. And what they would have done by donating money, those non-Jews would have um, tarried the building until they would be able to give a change of heart to Kairesh so that he would not agree to build it. So they really, these non-Jewish donors had the exact opposite intention then. They wanted that the base, I mean, this shouldn't be built. Should not. Well, then why are we donating money? Huh? We donate money, then our opinion counts. And our, they would somehow manipulate that they should delay the building of the base on Mikdash. And in the meantime, they were hoping that Kairish, who gave the okay to go ahead and build it, would have a change of heart and would cancel the whole plan and therefore the temple would not be built. <laughs> and therefore, according to Rava, first of all, that only applied back then, but otherwise, if a non-Jew says the erech, the value of so-and-so is upon me, and the so-and-so is a Jew, then that non-Jew was obligated to give that money to the Beis HaMikdash. And with that money, we will use it for the maintenance of the Beis HaMikdash. And there would be a rule of me'ila. That money that he gave becomes sacred, and it's to be used. And therefore, if somebody misuses those funds, that's like misusing anything else which belongs to the temple. And that would be a sin with all the ramifications of the rules of Me'ila. Mekivan Shein and Ignaz, because it's not buried, it's not put away. But rather, it is ready to be used for the upkeep or the maintenance of the Beis HaMikdash. Now they bring down further, interestingly. Yerushalmi, Amru. In the Talmud Yerushalmi, the other Talmud, they say as follows, Shiloi lachem velonu, that verse from Ezra, which says that the non-Jews cannot participate in the building or the maintenance of the temple, Neemar was stated, That's only when the non-Jew is donating something to the temple. When he's coming with a donation to the temple. That's where we don't accept it. 
Avobayarachin, but when it comes to this rule of this type of, of vow, who miskavin l'shamayim, he means to give it to Hashem. He doesn't mean to give it to the structure of the temple. He simply said that the value of so and so is upon me. And therefore the fact that we, the Jewish community, the Jewish Supreme Court, the treasury of the temple, is going to use it for the maintenance of the temple, that's like on its own almost. That's not what his donation is. His donation is to God. Okay, well, now what? Well, now the way you give money to God in this particular case is you give it to the Beis HaMikdash. And now what they do with it, which will be for the upkeep, is kind of like indirect or it's like happening automatically. And therefore, according to this opinion in the Yerushalmi, it is, does not fall into the category that you non-Jews cannot participate in the building of the Beis HaMikdash. Because it's not. You're not participating in the actual building. That would be if you come with, with bricks, or you come with stones, or you come with money, and you say, here, I want to participate in, in the... That's not what's happening. The person said, Erech, the value of so-and-so is upon me. Now he owes this amount of money, and that's it. All right, so, question is, who do we follow when it comes to Erechin? Rabbi Meir or Rabbi Yehuda? Rabbi Meir would mean that the guy cannot make the declaration, but he can be used as the article that the Jew now owes that amount of money. And according to Rabbi Yehuda, no, he can't use the guy, but he could be the one to make the declaration if he uses a Jew. La halacha nech When it comes to the halacha, there's a dispute amongst the codifiers post the Talmud. Yesh paisim ke Rabbi Meir. Some rule like Reb Meir that the guy cannot be the one to make the declaration or make the donation but he can be used as the person that the Jew says the value of so and so is upon me the Yesh Pesim Kirab Yehuda and then there are yet others who um, rule like Rabbi Yehuda so it's undetermined Now, when it comes to making vows for Jewish people, as I said earlier, it's quite clear the rules. Well, there's another rule. In order for basically any declaration or any statement or anything um, for a Jew to be worth anything and to count as anything, he or she needs to be um, of age cannot be a minor. And that would be bar or bas mitzvah. So for a Jewish male, age 13 determines his adulthood. Under 13, he's a child. He's irresponsible. And although he's developing and he's growing and he's maturing, but it's a process. So practically speaking, there really isn't much of a difference between a two-year-old and a 10-year-old, even though arguably you could say that. What do you mean? No, 10-year-old is just that much closer to being an adult. It doesn't happen overnight. But it actually does. Going from being irresponsible and not obligated to becoming responsible and obligated is basically like that. As soon as he turns 13. Okay. And... Many, many rules apply. Everything he's doing under 13 for the boy is pretty much referred to as chinuch, which basically means education, training, so that when he turns 13, he'll be able to do it. Um, one exception to that. There's one exception, biblically. <clears throat> and that is making a vow. If he's 13 years old and he made a vow, that's binding. He's got to keep what he said. If he is 11 years old and he made a vow, you only train him and, and teach him so that he shouldn't 
be, be careless, and then when he actually turns 13, he shouldn't be accustomed to making vows and not keeping them. So we force him to, but that's just because of chinuch, just for educational purposes. But it's not really that his vow means anything. Age 11, his words mean nothing. What about the one year prior to his turning bar mitzvah? From his 12th birthday for the boy till his 13th birthday. Very interesting. Biblically speaking, he is called a mufla samuch le'ish. An individual who articulates things when it comes to vows. And since he's close to adulthood, his words may mean and may not. We need to check. And we have to see, does he really understand what he said? And the ramifications of his statement. If he does, then it's binding as if he's bar mitzvah already. And if he doesn't, he's just a child. And by the way, interesting. If let's say at the beginning of his, of his being 12 years old, the beginning of the year, we checked him and he did understand and he made, and, and then we said, okay, it's binding. And then later towards the end of the year, right before he turned 13, he again made a certain type of vow. He needs to be checked again. We don't rely on the fact that, well, 10 months ago he knew what he was saying and we made him obligated. So certainly now, no, it can go back and forth. That whole year, every time, and it has nothing to do with how intelligent he is. You can have the most brilliant 11 years old, 11 year old, brilliant, great scholar, high IQ, knows all the rules and regulations. <coughs> he knows exactly how the vows work and everything. Irrelevant. He's not 12 yet. His words don't mean anything. And on the other end, you can have a 13 year old who didn't understand what they said, but they made a vow. It's binding. Whereas at age 12, we have to see, do they understand or not? So the question is, how does it apply to an Anju? Mufla samuch le'ish. This individual who's 12 years old, for the boy, that is. La seifim shebi Yisrael, ein nedarav nedarim elamid rabbanim. So there are those that hold that the whole idea that during that year, his vows are binding is only rabbinic. So according to that, Opinion. So if a non-Jew now made an erech, he said, the value of stones was upon me. According to Rabbi Yehuda, who said that Goyim could make that type of a vow. They can't be the subject, but they could be the, dec- the, the one who's making the declaration. So then, even if he's only 12 years old, he can do it. Shnis Rabbi Me'ish. Because he's included from the word Ish, as we said. Ki Yafli Homer Berchin. Which is, by Erchin, it says the word Ish Ki Yafli Neder. That if a man will be Mafli. And that word Yafli is that where we're learning out the age of 12 from. Val Tismal Zeh. And don't wonder about this. For we find in certain places where the Torah is stricter with the non-Jew than the Jew. So don't say, how can you have a rule where the non-Jew were being stricter with him of age 12 than with the Jew? That's not a problem. It says the word Yafli and it says Ish. So we're saying that for the non-Jew, this Erech business doesn't start at age 13, but rather age 12. Why isn't that a problem? Going, for example, beniske shor, when it comes to the damages of an axe. Oi, she Yisrael kishiyagdil yovid lichlal bal yachil. Or for a Jew, when he turns adult, bar mitzvah, he then has a separate prohibition of not... Um, not keeping his words. When he says something, he is transgressing if he doesn't keep his vow. So it's dependent for the Jew on his level. If he doesn't fall into the category of of being forbidden 
to not keep his vow, well, then he automatically is not a mufla. He's not in the category of being obligated to keep it that well, that year. But a non-Jew, even though he doesn't have the prohibition of Bal his hafla is not dependent on that. So basically what we're saying over here is that we have a unique case, <coughs> according to some that is, that for a non-Jew, according to Rabbi Huda, that he could be the one to actually make the vow of Erech, if he says about a Jew that the value of so-and-so is upon me, that wouldn't start at age 13 for the non-Jew, but it will actually start at age 12. Even though for the Jew, it doesn't necessarily work like that, but for the non-Jew, they're saying that it starts at age 12. This Erech, according to Rabbi Yehuda, according to this opinion within Rabbi Yehuda. But then he's going to go further and say now, that, um, when it comes actually to another point, when it comes to a making a vow of Erech, so for the Jew, if he is over Bar Mitzvah, over 13, even if he didn't really understand the ramifications of what he said, but because he made that declaration, and he said that the Erech, the value of so-and-so is upon me, and the guy is over 13, he has to pay according to the gender and the age. Whereas for the non-Jew, if he doesn't understand that, he didn't realize that, that even though he's an adult, then it's not binding. So there's certain areas over here we're being stricter and certain areas we're being more mm-hmm. lenient. Uh, I think we're going to leave it at this point to be continued uh, with the help of Hashem next time. Mm-hmm.